G'day and welcome to AOS Coach. In this video, I'm going to highlight all of the key changes that you need to know moving from 3rd edition Age of Sigma into 4th edition. Now, there has been a lot of changes, so I will focus on the core themes and the most impactful changes. Now, some of these topics will receive additional attention in a future video where I can deep dive. Before we get into the discussion, I just want to mention that Games Workshop did send me an early copy of 4th edition Age of Sigma to preview at no cost. They'll have no involvement in this video. And if you want to help the channel while picking up some hobby and your pre-orders, consider grabbing them through Warp Fire Minis in the USA, Element Games in the UK, or Gap Games in Australia. The affiliate links are down below in the episode description, and all of the support will be reinvested into the channel. Now let's have a look at all of the key changes in 4th edition. Let's start with the humble war scroll that you'll notice has had an overhaul. The wound characteristic is now known as the health characteristic, which will make the terminology a little cleaner. There has been a flow on effect when you are suffering damage rather than wounds, and you now inflict mortal damage rather than mortal wounds. The Git, Skaven, Cities, and anyone who's been terrorized by bravery will now rejoice because the characteristic has been removed. You no longer suffer Battleshock tests at the end of the turn. In its place, you will see an objective control score, which is used to see who controls the objective. Abilities have seen a rework. Not only will you notice some color coding that is tied to the phase that the ability takes place, but also you'll notice some cleanup when it comes to the timing, the description, and much clearer effects. Universal rampages like Roar and Stomp no longer exist. However, you will find some heroes and monsters will have similar abilities known as a rampage. The War Master ability that you would find on heroic leaders like Nagash, Kragnos, and Marathi as an example is now a keyword. One significant difference here is that the War Master must be picked as your general. No ifs, no buts, no coconuts, must be general. Standardized abilities like Ward and Fly will now be a keyword rather than an independent ability. So it's something that I initially missed when I was playing with some Rock Gut Troglots. I'm like, where's the Ward? And lo and behold, it was sitting as a keyword, not as an ability. You'll see a new set of keywords that are about the unit type that you have. And this is important to take notice of because there is counterplay when it comes to anti-X. Anti-X could be anti-infantry, anti-cavalry, anti-monster, anti-beast, anti-war machine, anti-hero, and all of these things come into play and will give you an additional rend bonus to the weapon profile if it's going into that type of unit. Anti-rules aren't just limited to unit types, but also can impact situations throughout the game. For example, Lumineth Wardens can soak up a charge with something called Anti-Charge, so their attacks back just got a little deadlier. Some units will have the Beast keyword. This is a new keyword for 4th edition, and most commonly you'll find this unit has a max control score of 1. Things like Felbat, Squig Herd, and Beast of Nurgles are a few examples of units that have the Beast keyword. While we're still talking about abilities, you will find them highlighted on the weapon profile. Things like shoot in combat, or crit 2 to hit, crit auto wound, or crit mortal. And for those who don't know what a crit is, it is a dice roll of a 6. So if I roll a 6 on a uh, crit to hit, 2 hits, it means it's an exploding 1 turns into 2 hits, or I don't have to roll a to wound roll, or it just does mortal damage depending on which ability it has. While we're talking also about weapons, you will notice that there is no longer a melee range profile. In the past, it used to have a range of 1, 2, or 3. That's because we now operate in a 3-inch combat zone, which will speed up your gameplay. We'll talk a little bit more about this throughout the game and obviously throughout the channel. There's been plenty of other minor tweaks like clear spell values, abilities having effect icons, but I'll let you discover the rest of them when you get into your faction war scrolls. Next up is army composition, and I will break this down into greater detail in another video. But to get you started, if you're coming from 3rd edition, you no longer have battle line requirements to fulfill, which may unlock your list building or who is your general. Uh, wizards and priests no longer have to pick an individual spell or prayer per wizard or priest. 
Rather, the army knows its entire chosen spell law or prayer law. There's no need to worry about grand strategies, triumphs, core battalions like Battle Regiment or Warlord, although there is a battalion-style army construction we'll talk about in a second. You can no longer ally units from outside your faction, with the exception of Regiments of Renown. So how do you build an army list in 4th edition? So army lists are built on one or more regiments, which are led by a hero. A regiment includes one hero and up to three non-hero units. A regiment can stand alone with a hero with no units. So it's zero to three along with a hero. Your general's regiment can include up to four non-hero units. Now remember that if you do take a unit that has the Warmaster keyword, it must be your general, though it won't lock you out of any of your heroic traits that you used to formerly known as a command trait. Your army can include a maximum of five regiments. However, some heroes like named characters may say that you can include another hero in that regiment. Units that are not placed into a regiment are known as auxiliary units. You can include any number of auxiliary units in your army list. However, the player with the fewest auxiliary units in their list will gain one extra command point at the start of each battle round. And this is really impactful. Units can still be reinforced to double their unit size for double their cost. However, you cannot triple the size of the unit. So we can all rest a little easier knowing that we don't have to chew through 60 zombies at a time. Units with a size of one or if they are unique cannot be reinforced. You still have the abilities to customize your army with sub-factions, heroic traits and enhancements. The gameplay of 4th edition has a lot in common with 3rd edition. I've had over 10 games now of 4th edition and through my time it's been a process of unlearning and relearning. There's a lot in common but there are some changes. The objective size has gotten smaller compared to 3rd edition. The objective is now a 40 mil round marker and contesting zone is 3 inches around that circle. Models can move over and end their move on the objective marker. If a player wins a priority roll and chooses to take a double turn, it will deny them an opportunity to pick a battle tactic for that turn. Now this has no impact if your opponent forces you to take the double turn, merely if you choose to take the double turn. Damage is allocated to the unit, you pull it up and then you remove models. You can no longer shoot into combat unless it is stated on your war scroll like we saw on the war scroll redesign example. All of your melee weapon ranges are now 3 inches because you have a zone of combat which is 3 inches. Your model coherency is now 0.5 inches which will make things like stringing out your units a little bit harder and you'll have to keep an eye on it for coherency purposes or you may be removing models. Everybody starts the battle round with four command points and you're likely fixed to that number of four unless you are receiving an auxiliary or a underdog benefit. We'll talk more about that in a minute, but there's no way to get an extra command point going second in the battle round. You can't issue heroic leadership. We'll talk about that in a second, uh, but you're really fixed to that four. So spend your command points wisely. And finally, if a unit retreats from combat, they will suffer D3 mortal damage when they retreat, unless their war scroll or their faction overrides that rule. I just alluded to it, but your heroic actions like heroic leadership or finest hour have been removed. There is no alternative mechanic introduced in 4th edition, so you'll really need to think about how you spend your command points because there's no way of getting that heroic leadership for an extra command point. There's no way to boost up your hero with finest hour, or there's no way to heal your hero through heroic recovery, although they will receive the rally benefit. We'll talk about that later. Previously mentioned on the War Scroll redesign, there is no universal monstrous rampages like Raw, Stomp, or Titanic Jewel, but some War Scrolls do have a rampage ability. As I flipped through the various faction packs, I did notice that the monsters you would expect to have a rampage mechanic certainly had one. Destruction Bros, we are well looked after when it comes to the rampage department. Yes, 
order, death, and chaos, you've got some as well. In third edition, there was a bonus for going second in the battle round, something like an extra command point, or you would get a boost tied to the battle plan. Throw that all out the window, because in fourth edition, we have something called the underdog mechanic. Whichever player has the fewest victory points is the underdog for the battle round. If a player is tied, so for example in the first battle round where neither of us have victory points, then there would be no underdog unless it specifies in the battle plan. So why is the underdog mechanic so important? First off, the underdog gets one extra command point that turn. Nice. In addition, each of the battle plans will have a twist mechanic, and through the twist mechanic, the underdog will receive a benefit. Some examples include Border War, where the underdog will score one additional victory point for each objective they control within both players' territories. The Staker Claim battle plan, the underdog can pick one objective. That objective is no longer controlled by either player and cannot be controlled this battle round. And in shifting priorities, the underdog can pick one objective marker to be the primary objective for that battle round. And the primary objective is worth one additional victory point to the player that controls it. So these are just a couple of examples. As you go through your general's handbook or you go through the core book, you will see the underdog mechanic play out a little bit more. What I've found through my experience is that the underdog mechanic helps create a closer, tighter game that will hopefully last for the duration of the five battle rounds. I found that it is a nice little reward to keep the person who is falling behind on victory points, you know, catch up a little bit it's not a huge boost but it's definitely a, a little bit of a nice to have uh, but also in addition it can definitely be weaponized where somebody might drop one victory point in the first battle round just to move into round two as the underdog so there's some tactical play in here as well as general play to help the person who is falling behind on victory points stay in the game for as long as possible Next, we'll talk about command points and command abilities, and I've already talked about the fact that both players get four command points at the start of each battle round, unless there's the underdog mechanic or the auxiliary mechanic, where you'd get the extra command point. I've also mentioned that there's no additional command point for going second in the battle round, or universal rules like heroic leadership to get you some extra, though I'm sure there's some war scrolls in the game that breaks that mechanic, but universally... Four is really the number you're looking at. Now when we talk about command abilities, you will notice that there has been a major overhaul with additions, removals, and modifications. Inspiring Presence obviously has been removed because there's no Battle Shock anymore. However, Unleash Hell has also been removed as a command ability, so you better protect your shooting units with better screens to stop them from being charged. Rally has been modified, you now roll 6d6, and for each 4+, plus, you get a Rally point. Now you can use that Rally point either to heal a health characteristic, or return a slain model if you have enough Rally points to return that model. If you have a unit musician, you will also receive an extra rally dice if that unit is going to rally, and some factions may modify that rule even further. Redeploy has also been modified. You no longer need an enemy unit finishing a move within 9 inches to trigger the redeploy. Instead, a unit that isn't in combat can move up to D6 when they, when they receive redeploy. Now, more excitingly though, we also have four new command abilities, including one that will cost you two command points. Magical Intervention lets a friendly unit cast a spell or chant a prayer in the opponent's hero phase. If you do so, subtract one from the casting or chanting roll made for that ability. The Cover Fire command ability allows you to shoot in the enemy shooting phase. The attacks must target the nearest visible enemy unit, and you must subtract one from the hit rolls for those attacks. Counter charge is our 2 CP command that allows you to charge in the opponent's charge phase. Just don't fail it like I have twice, because not only is it worth 2 CP, but you also can't re-roll it with forward to victory. Power through is the last of the new command abilities, and certainly one of my favorites. 
At the end of any turn, you can pick a friendly unit that has charged this turn to receive the ability. Then pick an enemy unit that you're in combat with, as long as the target has a lower health characteristic than this unit. So let's say, for example, my Stormcast Forminators, they are wanting to power through a bunch of clan rats. Inflict D3 mortal damage on the target. Then the unit using this ability can move a distance up to its movement characteristic. That move can pass through and end within the combat range of any enemy unit that it was in combat with at the start of the move. Finally, all out attack and all out defense and forward to victory remain unchanged. With a fixed amount of command points each turn, it has been a real interesting balancing act because if you spend your command points too soon, as I mentioned, there's no extra command points coming in the second battle round or using heroic leadership to generate me some more. So working out if I use that magical intervention and if it's worth it, for example, or making sure that you've got enough CP to do counter charge and still have a power through or all that attack or right defense has been a wonderful, interesting strategic balancing act. Being able to cast or chant in our opponent's turn isn't the only change when it comes to our wizards or priests. All of the universal spells and prayers have been removed. There's no Arcane Bolt, no Mystic Shield, no Bless, no Smite. All of those spells that you could also choose like Heal or Curse or Flaming Weapon, they've all been removed. When you're building a 4th edition list, you will select a Spell Law, a Prayer Law and a Manifestation Law. I will talk about Manifestation soon and there will be another video that will dig even deeper than that. Your wizards and priests will know all of the spells or prayers from your chosen law. So you no longer need to choose an individual spell or prayer and assign it to that hero. This will de-risk a lot of armies that rely on critical spells or prayers. So if one of those heroes dies, another wizard or priest can take over casting that important spell or prayer. One of my favorite changes happened to priests. Now when you make a chanting roll, you can save the dice roll from that chant for a future unleash of a prayer, or use it immediately. Say you've got a prayer with a chanting value of 5, and you roll a 4. You just get to keep that dice, and next turn when you make another roll, you just combine the results, and some of the prayers actually have an increased ability when you roll high enough, like an 8+, plus or a 10+. plus. This might be a solid reason to use magical intervention and get a jump start to your chanting before unleashing the prayer in your turn. Continuing the theme of spells and prayers, let's talk manifestations. Formerly, you would know these as endless spells and invocations. They now fall under the umbrella known as manifestations. And spoiler alert, they cost zero points. They are free. In addition to choosing a spell or a prayer law, you can choose one manifestation law for your army. There are six manifestation laws you can choose from, or you can choose your faction's manifestation law if you have one. Each of those manifestation laws has a predetermined set of endless spells and invocations that you can summon onto the board for no cost to your army list, but it will obviously require you to have a priest, or a wizard to bring them onto the table. Choosing one of the manifestation laws will lock you out of the others. So choose wisely. And yes, the Cronspine Incarnate is one of the manifestation laws, but the War Scroll isn't what you know from 3rd edition. Manifestations and terrain now have a health characteristic. So they can be selected as a target, they can be damaged, and they can be destroyed by your opponent, in addition to manifestations being removed by banishments. While a manifestation is treated as a part of your army that can fight or shoot depending on what it has on its war scroll, they can't receive commands or faction abilities, nor can they contest or control objectives. But we will talk more about manifestations in a future video. Grand strategies are just straight up gone and nothing has replaced it. Delete it from your memory. Battle tactics have been stripped right back. Everybody will play with a set of six universal battle tactics for all, 
then there is an extra two unique battle tactics for each of the grand alliances so death will have an extra two chaos will have an, a different set of two you get the gist uh faction battle tactics no longer exist currently i don't know what's in a battle tome so i don't know what future me is about to learn but no currently it's six plus two if you choose to take the double turn you are unable to score a battle tactic in that round so for example if i went second in battle round two won the priority role for battle round three and chose to go first i would be unable to select a battle tactic which would deny me some points if your opponent however wins the priority role and gives it to you still creating that double turn situation I'm still eligible to score a battle tactic. It's only if I choose to take the double. Completing a battle tactic is worth four victory points and the average battle plan has 10 victory points to score in each round. So realistically, think about the fact that you are giving up to 40% 40, 40 of your points in that turn. There will be situations where taking the double turn is still the right decision, but now the stakes are higher with a much higher risk versus reward. There's been plenty of changes with battle plans, terrains, and the introduction of terrain maps. Mysterious terrain no longer exists, so no longer do you have Arcane, Mystical, Damned, and the others that nobody cared about. There are now five types of terrain. Obstacle, Obscuring Terrain, Area Terrain, Place of Power, and Faction Terrain. Now, each of these types of terrain will have a predetermined Universal Terrain ability. For example, a Obstacle Terrain feature is both a Cover and Unstable. So what exactly are they? Cover will subtract one from hit rolls for attacks that target a unit that is behind or wholly within the terrain feature unless the unit has charged or has the Fly keyword. If it's impassable, models cannot move across, be set up, or end its move on any part of the terrain feature. When terrain is obscuring, a unit cannot be targeted by shooting attacks if it is behind or wholly within terrain feature, unless it has the fly keyword. And finally, an unstable terrain feature. Models can move across, but cannot be set up or end any type of move on a part of the terrain feature that is more than one inch tall. Finally, the Place of Power has a fun interactive feature where heroes within three inches of this terrain feature can use the Activate Place of Power ability. So what is that? You roll a dice. On a roll of a one, that hero fails to control the energy of the Place of Power, and you inflict D3 mortal damage to that hero. Unfortunately, that's happened to me at least once, to Marathi Kane taking damage, trying to control this Place of Power. I have learnt from that mistake. On a roll of a 2+, plus, the hero has successfully activated the place of power, and you get to add plus 1 to casting rolls and chanting rolls for that hero this turn. If that hero is not a wizard, they can use the unbind ability as if they were a wizard. Your faction terrain war scrolls will list which of the universal terrain features are in play, and each of the faction terrain rules are different, so just keep an eye on it. And because I love you, I'll give you a little bit of a bonus, and that is your command models. Your unit champion still gives you an extra attack. Your musician now gives you an extra rally dice should you use rally on them. And your standard bearer will improve your objective control score by one. So there's a lot of changes that has happened in 4th edition, but in my experience, it hasn't been a hard transition from 3rd to 4th. You will find moments where autopilot kicks in and you automatically go to cast that mystic shield or someone charges you and you want to go issue uh, unleash hell or you want to roar and try to bring something down. Unfortunately, it's just catching yourself in those moments. But after a few games, you do start to break the habit and you get knee deep into planning your counter charge or thinking about casting spells in your opponent's turn. I hope you found this video helpful getting you across all of the key changes and preparing you for 4th edition. If you did, make a sacrifice to the algorithm gods by giving the video a like, leaving me a comment. 
If you want to support the channel even further while picking up some hobby, consider grabbing it from Warp Fire Minis in the USA, Element Games in the UK, and Gap Games in Australia. Uh, click the link in the video description. Your support is greatly appreciated. I get a small amount of money in return, but all of that goes back into the channel. So until next time, don't damage your wizards like I already told you about on that place of power roll. Thanks for hanging around until the end. I hope you enjoyed that video and you walked away with a few new ideas. Now, if you did, I would love it if you pressed like on the video, as well as left me a comment with your thoughts. The conversation will continue over on Discord and the link is down below in the episode description. I also want to give a massive shout out to the AOS Coach patrons and YouTube members who are supporting the channel and the growth that you're seeing here. So cheers, you are all bloody legends. And until next time, don't roll a double one on a spell cast.